thank you everybody uh, for allowing me to be here. Um, I titled this Redlining in St. Paul. I'm going to be talking about redlining in St. Paul, but redlining in St. Paul is only a small part of kind of a bigger picture. Um, and we're going to go both way further back in history and way farther forward into the present than the video described. Uh, although it was exciting to see my former property law professor, John Powell, up there. Um, he also used to be on our board, which is kind of exciting. Um, so uh, Housing Justice Center um, wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization before I get started. So we're a nonprofit organization. We do both legal and policy advocacy. And we're very much focused on the preservation and production of housing that's affordable to the lowest income households and the protection of the rights of people who live there. And we use a bunch of different strategies in this work. So we do impact litigation. Uh, we're all attorneys and we do sue. Uh, we also do policy work on the federal, state, and local level. Uh, we do work nationwide, although the focus of most of our work is in the Twin Cities metro area and in greater Minnesota. Um, but we help out sometimes around the country when issues pop up that kind of fit into our specialized expertise. Um, we also do a lot of collaborative work with community-based organizations. So everything that we do is really focused on connecting to community articulated issues and needs and making sure that we're working with communities as opposed to working at communities. Um, we started about 20 years ago um, kind of growing up around this issue of the loss of federally subsidized affordable rental housing um, and have subsequently moved into a bunch of different areas including the preservation of unsubsidized affordable housing, a lot of work with manufactured home communities. If you want a deep dive into mobile home park law, I'm your gal. I love that stuff. Um, and we also do a lot of um, tenant protection policies. Much of our work is focused in uh, concepts related to fair housing and this idea that everybody needs a safe, stable place to call home in the community of their choice that they can afford and that choices have to be real choices and not fake choices. Okay. Um, so I like to throw out ideas and see he, how people react to them. So I'm going to put you a little bit to work, and I don't know if we're too early in the conversation for that, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, so here's, here's a statement. I want to get people's reactions to it. Current housing disparities are the consequence of deliberate decisions. OK. Seems like we have sort of general agreement on that. Um, and this is something that is has been sort of an interesting idea uh, when you hear people talk about housing. Because uh, a lot of people talk about the market as though the market is this thing that exists outside of us and outside of a, a series of decisions that are made that cause things to happen. That's not to say that the consequences of those decisions are always the ones that are intended. We have unintended consequences happening all the time. But somebody did something or made a choice. They made it out of a set of beliefs, a set of interests, and it caused other things to happen. This also means, however, that we can make a set of choices that address a history of disparities that have been created by these prior choices that are made. And let's forward to the next one. So um, I'm going to go way back in history. Um, I really wanted to start, as we're talking about these issues of land and land ownership, who it belongs to and what it means, we have to acknowledge that um, there were people here first. It wasn't that like in 1930, redlining started and then housing disparities occurred. There were a lot of decisions that were made prior to that. Um, this map is from a gentleman named Aaron Carapella. Um, you should check out his website. It's called Tribal Nations Maps. This is just a small part of a bigger map that I liked so much. I bought a digital copy just so I could put this in here. And this lays out um, some of the place names and the people who were here well before colonization happened. We know that the oldest um, burial mounds in St. Paul are actually more than 2,000 years old. 
Um, and that the land that we're on today and the land we're talking about when we're talking about sort of the buying and selling and ownership of land, it was stolen. And sometimes it was stolen multiple times. When you think about the history of you know, the extraction of uh, minerals, when you talk about the building of the railroad, when you talk about um, the harvesting of timber, um, a lot of the, the big wealth that exists in our state, some of which now comes to us through foundations, really came initially from land that was stolen. Um, there is a lot of history, a lot of very important history about um, Native American tribes in Minnesota um, that I encourage people to, to dig into. And I will just admit that I am probably not the person who can give you the richness of this history that I think this topic deserves. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start in 1950 to just kind of give you a picture of the way things change very rapidly between sort of the beginning of our story and today. So in 1850, in St. Paul, there were 1,112 people. Well, in St. Paul, so, you know. This was, the, this was the census, so they're going to use the definition of the population based on the census. Um, and you'll see that very quickly that population grew till you got to 1930, where you had 271,000 people. Now, interestingly, although the population has gone up and down since uh, 1930, that number is not that far off from where we are today in terms of population. Right now, uh, St. Paul, I think, is around 315, 320,000 people. Wouldn't quote me on that. And we're heading into the next decennial census, so we'll have a much better number of it. Um, but really, the story is that principally, we got approximately the same amount of people as we did then. Um, you know, before we go into sort of like 1930 and what started happening with redlining, I think it's important to kind of get a sense of how home ownership existed during this time period. Um, first of all, people, because of uh, the way that the federal government was treating tribal lands, were able to buy a lot of land across Minnesota really, really cheap. Um, but um, in St. Paul, you know, it was kind of a more metropolitan area, or started to be that around there. Um, in the 1800s, typically speaking, in the late 1800s, people could access mortgages. They were done through local banks, and the average length of a mortgage was six years. And the average amount of the mortgage was not more than 50% of the value of what you were buying which gives you kind of a sense of some of those barriers to becoming a landowner, becoming a homeowner, although land costs were much less expensive and a lot of people were, were building their own homes. The other thing about these mortgages is they were adjustable pretty much every year. Um, then as you got a little bit later on, like past 1900, uh, there started to be sort of this buying and selling of these mortgage products. And so in the 1920s, where people were taking on a little bit more debt, you had uh, folks in the, on the East Coast, principally, who were buying some of that debt. Well, these were absolutely not sustainable because, once again, it was adjusting every year. And when the Great Depression hit, one out of 10 mortgages uh, went into foreclosure. So it was a pretty substantial hit. Values absolutely collapsed. And in part because of that, the FHA was established because they wanted to stabilize the housing market. Um, and so suddenly, as opposed to local banks doing most of the lending and mortgages, you had the federal government getting involved because they wanted to sort of fix the economy that was broken. Um, and so that's where you start to get into redlining. So uh, around about 1935, the FHA uh, created the Home Owners Loan Corporation. And you'll sometimes see that H-O-L-C is the acronym. And if you read a lot about redlining, you'll see H-O-L-C popping up a lot. And this is where um, they started, at the request of the Federal Home Loan Bank, creating these color-coded maps and really what they were intended to do was assess risk. Um, so you had your A grade through your D grade. Um, these are the percentages for the city of St. Paul. We'll get to the map in just a second. But you'll see that 13% of St. Paul was considered the best. 
28 still desirable, 31% definitely declining and de-hazardous. And a lot of the time, these grades, the negative grades, were associated with households of color, um, Jewish households, immigrant households, um, and areas that were lower income. Um, and this was even though St. Paul had actually a relatively low percentage of households of color at the time the map was first established. So you can kind of see it a little bit. Um, you'll see popping up in the red, you've got um, sort of like the Rondo Frogtown area, parts of the east side, parts of west 7th. Um, and then your medium risk, you've got more of the east side. Oh, and in the red, you also have part of the west side as well, too. Um, and the blue areas are you know, the Summit Avenue area, um, sort of the Cherokee uh, Park area and bits of Highlands. Um, and then your A area uh, is Highland Park. Um, <laughs> shocking and surprising. There are also major areas of this that were undeveloped at that time or underdeveloped or they were primarily kind of more industrial area. Um, so the maps were used then to decide um, where banks were going to lend because those were the areas where if, if you had a high grade, it was considered a lower risk uh, proposition to make a mortgage there. Um, and that was the direction that, um, that banks were getting from um, the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank, um, who was going to be backing uh, these mortgages. And everybody wanted their mortgages backed because they didn't want to see things collapse the way they did uh, in the Great Depression. Um, and so this sort of establishes then a sense of what's happening. So if you were in a red area, chances were either you couldn't get a mortgage at all um, or the mortgage you got was like really terrible and wasn't sort of a standard mortgage. Okay, let's flip to the next one. Um, so when you look at... Um, I don't know that there's like, I haven't seen sort of like a tight criteria on it, but there's a lot of correlation to two things. One was there is some correlation to housing condition, but then the second is there's a lot of correlation to the demographic characteristics of those areas. So they were grading housing stock, but then a lot of it was looking at people. The other thing that you'll find is that um, there's a lot of bias against density in the way that they did their grading system as well, too. So areas that were more dense tended to get lower grades than more of your sort of suburban areas. And you know, one thing that actually probably would, would be helpful is to look at sort of a later map where you're capturing some of the suburban community. When they first put out the maps, like the ones that I was seeing in the Twin Cities metro area, you could see Minneapolis and you could see St. Paul, but you really couldn't see um, much in terms of the surrounding communities. And I tended to keep this focused on, on St. Paul. Um, there is a really good book. Um, I have a list of, of references at the end. Uh, that's definitely worth reading if you want to delve into this a little bit more, called The Color of Law, uh, that talks about the entire history of the way that decisions that were made by the federal government uh, using the law as a tool created segregative patterns and patterns of, of disinvestment. Um, so, um, Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, and any time people can hop in. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that redlining was just one of many ways uh, that households of color were prevented from accessing home ownership opportunities during this time. Um, as the video pointed out, the denial of African American borrowers under the GI Bill, um, you know, when the GIs were coming back in the mid 1940s, uh, there was a real shortage of housing opportunities, and there was this push to create more and more housing. Um, they created the GI Bill. It also created um, VA loans. And VA loans were fantastic because there, suddenly, you could borrow up to 95% of the value of a house, where before that, you had to put down a very substantial down payment. You know, even under those sort of the uh, federal home loan bank, you were still probably putting down around 20%. Suddenly you could put down 5%. And the loan term 
was 30 years. We think of this as a pretty standard loan term nowadays, but back then it was pretty unusual. And it really opened the doors to a lot of people accessing home ownership. But African American borrowers in particular were kept out of um, accessing VA loans. And there are some pretty compelling narratives about that. Um, the other thing um, that was happening around this time was racially restrictive covenants. So there were areas where in the property records, people were prohibiting folks from selling to um, different racial and demographic groups. Um, there's a big uh, project, the Mapping Prejudice Project. If you haven't heard of it, I um, recommend that you check it out. Um, they're based at the University of Minnesota, and they um, have been going through and identifying in Minneapolis where those racially restrictive covenants are. They're now expanding that work to other cities. Um, and there's a really great documentary that was done by PBS by a documentarian named Dan Bergen, um, which is called Jim Crow of the North, that talks about and captures some of the narratives about people who were sort of affected by these racially restrictive covenants. Um, and then the last thing is steering. So even if you didn't have a racially restrictive covenant, even if you could access financing, you still potentially had problems with steering, which would say for households of color, you know, hey, you have to live here, or we're only going to show you housing opportunities in certain areas. And the thing that happens is you get this sort of like really interesting interplay, right? If you've got this base map of values um, that was created that's saying we're going to create uh, great loans in some places and not in other places, and then households of color are only steered to the places that are deemed to be hazardous or lower value, and the racially restrictive covenants prevent you from accessing home ownership opportunities anywhere else, suddenly what it's doing is it is determining where people are going to be living uh, based on race. So there, are some, there were some legal frameworks that were created to try and address some of the consequences of redlining and other discriminatory housing activities. Um, that some of them applied just to home ownership, some of them applied to home ownership and rental housing, uh, some of them also applied to land use planning, which I can get to. Um, one was the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act. In 1968, we finally decided that housing discrimination was a really bad thing and we should prohibit it under federal law. I will come back to some issues with the Federal Fair Housing Act at the end of this presentation. Um, but, the Federal Fair Housing Act, in and of itself, well, it had things in it that would presume to eliminate redlining, it actually didn't say you can't do redlining. Um, there's also the Minnesota Human Rights Act. Uh, it's great. Uh, it does many, many fine things to prohibit uh, discrimination in uh, the sale of housing and in the rental of housing. The Home Mortgage Disclosure Act is really interesting. Um, so that was... Um, passed um, after the Fair Housing Act and what it did is it began to expose some of the underlying data what was actually happening with mortgage lending and if you ever hear the term humda data that's what they're talking about and there you can see what's happening uh, with loan denials based on race based on income um, and then finally, the Community Reinvestment Act, which actually for the first time in law said you can't redline. The other things you get to not being able to redline, but there they explicitly said you cannot redline. And that was passed in 1977. So theoretically up to that point in time, if you were super tricky, you could probably get away with things. Um, the other thing is, well, all of this um, and particularly the Community Reinvestment Act, addresses this issue directly of redlining. You can't draw maps that say we will lend here and we won't lend here. There are other ways that housing discriminatory patterns exist in mortgage lending. Um, a really good example is um, in insurance. Insurance redlining is a huge issue. You cannot get a mortgage if you can't get insurance. And insurance um, underwriting is somewhat mysterious and people have used the Federal Fair Housing Act to try and address discrimination in um, insurance. But that persists as an important issue. Um, the other issue that pops up a lot 
is um, credit scoring as well, too. And we'll get to that in a second. OK, so another bro broad statement for people to react to. History is not something in the rearview mirror. We live with the past every day. <laughs> OK, there we go. Um, <laughs> Actually, if you back up a few maps to the redlining map, you pretty much get an idea of where the demographics are in the city of St. Paul today, which was sort of my point, and that is, you know, what happened here kind of got locked into place in a lot of ways. And when you look where communities of color live and where white communities live today in St. Paul, it looks an awful lot like this map. There are some fine differences, but principally, um, if you look at the red and yellow areas, that's where today most of the households of color are living. St. Paul currently has one of the lowest homeownership rates in the nation among black households. If it were not for Irvine, Texas, and Paradise, Nevada, we would be the worst. And uh, you can't really see it because of the washing out. Um, but the little purple house is um, the data from 2016. There's a little gray house that's a few clicks up. That was the data from 2011. Our homeownership rate among black households actually fell between 2011 and 2016. Uh, you'll see we're uh, just behind Madison, Wisconsin, then uh, Minneapolis is, is down there as well, too. Um, and currently, uh, the homeownership rate among black households in St. Paul is less than 17%. So um, this is homeownership by race and ethnicity. You'll see black or African American is 16.9%. Uh, uh, white alone, non-Hispanic, is 61.2%. And other folks kind of fall in there in a variety of different ways. Um, any which way you slice it, though, uh, this is a pretty substantial disparity. Um, and it's something that, once again, as we saw in the video, that discussion about the role that how home ownership plays in household wealth is really a significant one. So here's one I'd love to get people's react to. The housing market is not broken. It is working exactly as intended by the people who created it. <laughs> I have a lot of discussion with people about this particular question, and that is, is the housing market broken, or is it operating the way it was designed, and just not designed for what we need today, and for what people need today? Um, so do we need to fix the system, or do we need to transform the system in a more fundamental way if we want to address some of these sort of like baked-in disparities that exist within our housing system? So causes, consequences, or both. Um, one of the things that happens a lot when you're in discussion about home ownership is people will give you a lot of reasons why, um, particularly households of color, cannot access home ownership. And the question, there's a little bit of a chicken or egg there, right? Like, are we trying to solve for our problems today? Are we trying to make up for what was happening in the past or all of the above? Uh, one that gets pointed out a lot is disparities in wealth. Um, so, according to the Institute for Policy Studies and CFED, they do these reports every once in a while that talk about the wealth of households and wealth disparities. And a few years back, they did one, and it said that if we're on our current trajectory with our current system and we don't make some substantial transformations, it will take 228 years for black households and white households to. to close that gap, that disparity. And people got very interested and engaged in this issue. And now that number is 240 years. So we have made a lack of progress. Um, things happened in that intervening time with our economy, um, but still that sort of uh, transformative work to address that disparity is, is simply not there. And one of the questions about wealth disparities, of course, is, you know, do you have to address some of these wealth disparities in order to get people into home ownership opportunities? Or do you say the wealth disparities exist because people have been denied access to home ownership opportunities? And therefore, we have to think about the relationship between ownership and wealth 
in a fundamentally different way if we want to make any progress. The second is, so that's a sort of a national number, the 240, but it, in St. Paul, it's probably worse because our disparities are worse. Second, income disparities. So this is a St. Paul number. There is a $28,763 gap right now between white households and households of color in income. To put that into context, um, the area median income of the Twin Cities metropolitan area, and as a housing nerd, I talk about area median income a lot just as an anchoring point, but it actually isn't that informative in some ways because your experience if you're at 29% of AMI is not that much different from your experience if you're at 31% of AMI. In either case, you cannot afford a place to call home. But uh, the AMI for the Twin Cities metropolitan area, which is once again quite large, is $100,000 a year for a family of four. So 30% of AMI, or what we consider extremely low income, is a household making less than about $30,000 a year. And the gap between white households and households of color is as big as that. The other interesting statistic, when you think about what's happening in St. Paul with households and income and housing disparities, is fully a quarter of households in the city of St. Paul are at 30% or below area median income. And part of that is because we live in a very prosperous region with vast disparities. So as you think about sort of tucking in some of the higher income areas of concentrated white wealth in the suburbs into our calculation of area median income, suddenly these ideas about, form, about affordability that exists from a programmatic standpoint just don't translate particularly well to the needs of households in the Twin Cities metropolitan area in St. Paul. If you think about what people need more broadly, maybe. But in St. Paul, what does it mean to make 60% of area median income? That's $60,000 a year. That's actually not far off from the area median income. So that can be affordable, but the question is affordable to who? And if you think about affordability not as measured against sort of an abstract person, but against the needs of individuals who live in communities, then your conception of what you need in order to be affordable changes an awful lot. And as I think about the communities that you're all working in and volunteering in, that's a really important question. I worked for a number of years at the State Housing Finance Agency, and in that work, I spent a lot of time talking with people in communities. And the number one question that I got when affordable housing was created in communities was affordable to who? It's not affordable to us. It's programmatically affordable, it's technically affordable, but we can't afford it. Um, and so that distinction becomes a very important one. Um, another issue that is one of these, like, could be a cause, is a consequence, is probably both, is the disparity in credit scores. So right now, the median credit score, and I'm gonna admit to cheating and saying this number's from Minneapolis, because I couldn't find one for St. Paul, um, <laughs> but it's probably close enough. The median credit score in predominantly white areas was 720 compared to a median uh, credit score of 570 in predominantly non-white areas. Um, and that tells you a lot because you, you can certainly buy a house if you have a 720 credit score. Um, you're probably not going to be able to access home ownership opportunities with very narrow exceptions probably through Habitat for Humanity with a 570 credit score. And in fact, when you look at rental screening criteria, um, many rental properties also require minimum credit scores in order to access rental housing. So not only can you not buy a home and build that sort of intergenerational wealth that we typically associate with home ownership, even finding a place to live at all um, can become much more challenging based on credit scores. And there's been some really interesting research looking at credit scores and the way that credit scores are calculated and the way that it is sort of baking in disparities. Um, there was a report done by the Urban Institute 
that really articulated something that I think people had realized all along, and that is there are really two banking systems. And one of those banking systems is for higher income white households, and the other is for lower income households of color, typically. And the banking system that exists for lower income households of color tends to be very exploitative in the terms that are utilized. So it tends to have much uh, higher interest rates with shorter terms, and they tend to report uh, missed payments very quickly. If all you can access are bad loans that are designed for you to fail, you're going to fail at those. And when you fail at those, that's going to affect your credit score, and it's just going to go ticking on down. Whereas if what you can access are good loans that are prime loans that are on fair terms, um, you're probably more likely to be successful, and your credit score is more likely to be higher. Um, there is some really great research about this sort of correlation and disparities in credit scores that's been done at the University of Minnesota um, by a professor named Sam Myers. Um, and he actually had a co-author on his last report, Juan Fee Lee. It is fantastic, fantastic work, because he's managed to access some really important data um, from the Federal Reserve and able to do a deeper level of analysis. Fair warning, you have to be a little bit nerdy in order to delve into it. Um, there's some pretty complex math in there that it just goes over my head. Um, a lot of zeta th functions and stuff like that because they are economists. Um, but there are some really important, I think, um, findings in that work. Um, one of the things that's really interesting um, that they found um, is that um, disparities in home ownership exist in communities sort of regardless of the census tract typology with regards to race and income. So white home ownership rates are pretty much the same in high and low income tracts, and black home ownership rates are pretty much the same in high and low income tracts. Like your ability to access home ownership is more based on your race than where you're living, which is interesting. So this is uh, showing uh, denial rates uh, by race based on income. Um, one of the things that people say periodically, and you know, if you think about the last slide, that idea about the income disparities, like, oh, well, income disparities, therefore, that accounts for a lot of home ownership disparities. Well, yeah, not really. Because you'll see, so the blue line is um, white home ownership denials. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but it starts very low income to higher income. The red line is black homeownership denial rates, starting from very low income to higher income. And you'll see that the denial rate for mortgages for the very highest income black households is significantly higher than the denial rate for the very lowest income white households. So you can't say that it's just because of income disparities. Well, income disparities are very important and something that needs to be addressed. There is also discrimination that is happening within the mortgage lending system that probably does a better job of accounting for what's happening here. Um, you'll also see there are the denial rates of different races as well, too. Um, Interestingly, sort of on the lower income side, you'll see that the denial rates for um, Hispanic and Latino households is, is higher. On the higher income side, it tips up, but it's somewhere in the middle. It tends to track pretty much um, evenly with um, Asian households, and then, of course, white households have the lowest denial rates overall. Another thing that I think is sort of important context as we think about what happened in the Twin Cities metropolitan area as well, you can't talk about homeownership and lending in the Twin Cities area in 2019 without talking a little bit about what happened uh, in the subprime mortgage market. Um, so this map was actually uh, commissioned by the folks at uh, Frogtown Neighborhood Association where they were trying to understand what was happening with, um, there was a period of time where they had a lot of vacant properties because there were a ton of foreclosures happening in their community. Um, and this is really trying to show uh, the percentage of loans that are categorizable as unstable, so principally subprime, 
uh, mortgages that are more or less designed to fail. And if you think back to that redlining map we saw at the very beginning, I mean, it's this, these patterns just repeat themselves again and again and again. And you'll see that the percentage of those subprime loans that exists in kind of Rondo, Frogtown area, in bits of the east side, um, you know, that's what was sort of leading to a whole lot of foreclosures. If loans are designed to fail, they're going to fail. Um, also, interestingly, um, you know, the next question is, well, then what happened to the properties, right? Um, what happened to both the people and the homes that they lived in? And you start to see um, some interesting things popping up today as markets have changed pretty significantly. Um, so this comes from a study that was done at the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs um, by uh, Ed Getz and Dr. Brittany Lewis um, and their colleagues. Um, another report that I highly recommend people, if you have an opportunity to check out. Um, they decided to really interrogate the question of, is gentrification happening in the Twin Cities metropolitan area? And what is happening? What does that look like? So they did both a quantitative analysis to de define where gentrification is occurring and also a qualitative analysis where they actually talked to people about their experience in communities that were gentrifying. And of the communities that were gentrifiable, there were a number in St. Paul, they also did this in Minneapolis too, but I just picked the St. Paul stuff because we're here. Um, there were a number that they identified as gentrifying communities. That's not to say that these are the communities today that have you know, the highest incomes and the highest rents and the highest home values, but they're the ones where you saw a substantial change happen over time and that that change was happening in places where you had vulnerabilities uh, to gentrification. And once again, these patterns are kind of repeating themselves over time. Um, and you'll see that some of the areas that pop up in this map are areas that experienced subprime blending in a pretty significant way. And so then you had more speculation from investors acquiring those properties and really flipping them to something else as opposed to investing in community ownership. Um, once again, highly recommend the report. It is really fascinating and in particular, it's, it's interesting to hear the stories of the different ways that people are experiencing change in their communities. Gentrification and displacement being something that doesn't just happen because of economic factors, but also happening because of social factors as well too. It's not just about can I afford my community, it's about is my community my community and does it still work for me? Um, so, um, so this is a statement that I think is worth having some discussion about. What worked for people in the past does not necessarily work for people in the future. So if you think back to that number, about the 240 years it would take to close the wealth gap, and you think about the way that people access intergenerational wealth starting back, well, in the 1800s, but really through these government programs starting in the 1930s where you were able to access these FHA loans using the VA loans, um, some people got a significant head start and other people didn't. And when people got that head start, it was at a period of time where ho home ownership opportunities in the Twin Cities metropolitan area were a lot easier to access in some ways. Things cost less. And now things are getting much more expensive. We currently have vacancy rates that are well under 5%, which is what's considered a healthy market. Rents are going up. The cost of home ownership is going up. So if we say, okay, what worked for people in the past, the pathway that existed for folks to get intergenerational wealth creation through home ownership in the past is the same path that people in the future should be using. On the one hand, well, it worked in the past. On the other hand, how do you catch up to things that happened over a period of now, you know, coming up on like 80 years or 90 years? On the other hand, um, the other thing that, that people really struggle with is, okay, so say we're not gonna use what happened in the past. 
And the priority isn't on single family home ownership. And it's on alternative ownership structures and finding different ways for people to own um, homes. Um, maybe it's not owning it outright. Maybe it's a community land trust. Maybe it's cooperative models. Or maybe it's thinking about separating this issue of creating intergenerational wealth from the concept of ownership as being sort of the bedrock of that. Um, but then the question occurs, OK, well, but we haven't tried that yet. Is it going to have the results we need? Is it going to make up for sort of these past disparities? And I think an important consideration in all of this is, who gets to make that choice? Certainly not me. <laughs> you know, the folks who are affected by the disparities need to be in the driver's seat making choices about what that future looks like. But we've created systems and structures that preclude people a lot of the time from being part of some of those conversations. So just want to get kind of some reactions from people of how you feel about like that push-pull. Is the gentrification another way of redlining? Um, I don't know, that's an interesting question. You know, one thing that has come up, it's not quite redlining, but the role that gentrification plays on home values. Um, and this was a big point of discussion when they were developing the Green Line. Um, so like the Frogtown folks are really um, thinking about this a lot. And that is, what is the effect of the increase in taxes on existing homeowners? And what is the effect of, ex of increasing home prices on creating new opportunities for people to buy into markets? Um, the, one of the things that they were pushing for at that point in time was kind of like a, trying to get a little bit of a moratorium on tax increases or a tax breaker or something like that. Um, because the question was, if you have this major public investment in a community, who gets to benefit long term from that? And, if, and people were concerned that if their taxes went up enough that they would never get those benefits because they couldn't afford to stay there. Um, and this is a continuing conversation um, in that area. It, a related conversation that's happening right now in St. Paul um, and certainly in the Frogtown neighborhood, but a bunch of other neighborhoods as well, is what happens with publicly owned land. Um, so there's a lot of land that's still owned by the city of St. Paul. Um, some of it is individual lots um, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis that were acquired uh, when houses were demoed. Some of it is just kind of like incidentally owned. Um, and this question, and some of it is much bigger lots that are developable for maybe affordable multifamily housing. Um, but there's real concern about, you know, is public land going to be used for public benefit or is public land going to be a benefit because it sells for the highest price? One of them has kind of this sort of like longer term effect. If you create something that has public benefit, like affordable housing, um, that's sort of a long term benefit. If you get the highest price, you maybe get a short term benefit out of it. Um, in the, you know, money. Uh, but what does that mean a few years down the road? Um, and then there continues to be discussion and a lot of debate about um, development in uh, lower income areas of the city of St. Paul and the effect of development and what kind of development is occurring. I think a good example is um, next to the Wilder Square Cooperative, uh, which is a principally African-American affordable housing cooperative um, in St. Paul, uh, there is a parcel of land uh, that's going to be redeveloped um, by a developer, Alatus. They're proposing rents that are about triple the uh, market rents in that area. So much higher end development. So what are the ripple effects of having higher costs rental properties in lower income areas. Um, are there benefits? Are there burdens that exist? Does it create uh, waves in the market? Does it drive up costs? Does it drive down? You know? um, and I would say that this has been a real point of debate and contention 
where affordable housing is created and why, where market rate housing is created and why. If you want to really get into the weeds of this debate, um, I would recommend reading works by Myra Norfield and Ed Getz. So, um, both of them have done some really interesting writing. Um, Ed just published a book uh, very recently called um, The One-Way Street of Integration um, that's really talking about the burdens that are placed on households of color to undo a history of segregation um, and that that's probably not the approach that we need to be taking because why should the people who are affected by sort of these public decisions that created segregative patterns then be responsible for like changing their communities and moving away and it's it's really interesting stuff um, other reflections yes I mean, my personal opinion, right? Um, I mean, uh, so I'm pro reparations. Um, and part of it is because, for a number of reasons, I mean, um, you know, people were discriminated against, people were kept out of opportunities. That does have longer term consequences. So, thinking about how do you sort of make up for a past that we, we can't redo it. Um, so how do you address it? Um, you know, one of the interesting things working in the world of, of fair housing as well too, and looking at some of these sort of embedded systems of discrimination. I mean, one of the questions is always like, how do you how do you redress these sort of longer term uh, harms that were created? So. It's a an, it's an really interesting discussion. And I think one of the ways it plays out, too, is these questions that I think people are asking all the time about where public investment occurs, who is burdened, and who benefits. I think a prime example of that is some of the work that's now happening to repair some of the harms that exist in the Rondo community uh, because of the destruction of principally like middle class home ownership among an African American community that was entirely wiped out. The wealth loss there is substantial. The community loss there and the, like, the trauma that people experienced is tremendous. Um, and so there's been a lot of work to try and do some healing, but then also to do some investment um, that's going to kind of re-knit that community together. Yeah, there's, um, I can't remember who did it. And, uh, Unfortunately, um, there is, has been a, sort of a stream of, um, of research um, and kind of inquiry on that question. Um, how do you sort of disconnect this concept of sort of intergenerational wealth from the ownership of homes? Um, you know, and there's also some interesting stuff happening too. Like, I think we look at today and say, oh yeah, like young people aren't buying homes. Oh, in a few years they are. And when you ask people if they want to, they say yes. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that sort of uh, wealth that's coming through like intellectual property and technology kind of plays out in the longer term. But I think it's a really important question. You know, the other thing too, is as somebody who's working principally with rental housing as well, I mean, there is sort of this interesting balance, like do you invest resources in home ownership because of this intergenerational wealth creation that's happening, or do you invest resources in creating housing opportunities, safe, stable, affordable places for people to call home who can't be homeowners for one reason or another. A lot of it is because they just don't have the income uh, to buy homes. Hmm? Yeah, student loans are playing, uh, she was talking about student loans, they're playing a huge role uh, in housing, both in people's ability to access mortgages, but also people's ability to feel like they can access a mortgage. I mean, there's, you know, will people lend to you if you have really high student loan debt? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but also, are you going to put yourself in that position, uh, especially because, you know, when you buy a home, your mobility changes as well too. Um, I still have student loans, I'll admit it. I make a lot of decisions based on that. It's tricky. Law school ain't cheap. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, let's flip to the next slide. Um, so there's something you can do today <laughs> um, that will make a difference, even if it's only a difference for a very short amount of time. So right now, HUD, through tomorrow at midnight Eastern time, 11 Central time, is taking public comments about a proposed rule related to disparate impact under the Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act. And disparate impact is the thing that says, even if you don't say you're doing something because of discriminatory reasons, in fact, even if you don't intend to do something because of discriminatory reasons, if something has a disparate impact on a protected class, which includes race, color, religion, family status, disability, probably forgetting a couple right now because I'm in the moment, um, that you still have the ability to challenge that activity under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And, and this has existed, uh, you know, kind of since 1968, and every um, circuit court has adopted disparate impact analysis, and then finally the Supreme Court, in a rule called Inclusive Communities v. Texas, um, said, yes, disparate impact is a thing, and it really, really does exist. And the typical test for disparate impact that existed at the district court level, and I mean at the appellate court level, is this sort of three-part test that shifts the burden back and forth, and I'm not going to go into the details of it because I can get very weedy about it. And what the current administration proposed is to change from a three-part burden-shifting test to a five-part test that is almost impossible. Not only that, they carve out a major exception if you're using an algorithm to make your decision. Saying, well, if you use an algorithm and it's not using race or a proxy for race as a factor, then even if it has disparate results, you don't get captured under disparate impact. Or if you use a third party algorithm, like say, for example, credit scores as part of your decision making, that's not a disparate impact issue. Or if you have your algorithm vetted by a third party, that's not covered by disparate impact too. So if all of this information about housing disparities in home ownership, and it certainly exists in the rental world as well too, it also exists in land use planning, which is a big area that we, we get pretty uh, feisty about. Um, if you're concerned about this, now is your chance to submit comments to HUD saying, hey, don't do this. And there are two kind of national collaboratives that have organized a lot of really great information about it. So fightforhousingjustice.org and defendcivilrights.org. They have a lot of info sheets where you can read about disparate impact and get into the details. Uh, they also have places where you can go submit your comments here. You can also go directly to the federal government and submit your comments. This is just easier, and they've got a lot of great background information. Yes. So two things. One, both of these groups have sort of sample language already plugged in. But the most important thing is that you have something that's specific to you and your experience in your community and what you're seeing. Because the magic of submitting comments is that they have to read them and they have to respond to them. So they're not going to respond to you, but when they put out the final rule, they have to respond to every issue that pops up. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to craft these amazing comments. I mean, we've got a lot of comments, and we are threatening to sue them in our comments. But I am not naive enough to think that we are going to submit these brilliant comments, and the scales will fall from their eyes, and they will see housing justice. But honestly, if you submit comments, that's like three more minutes, the time they take to read it that disparate impact still exists as a real thing. So the more people who submit comments, the more of their time we're using, the more time disparate impact is real. Uh, so we're trying to extend this time frame as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, 
once they issue their final rule, which will be about the same as the rule they have now, um, then everybody will sue them and we'll try and enjoin it and once again try and draw up that clock a little bit more. Um, Particularly that stuff about algorithms, though. You know, when you think about what's happening with, with housing lending and tenant screening and stuff like that, everybody's using algorithms for everything. And what you put into the algorithm dictates what you get out of it. So, you know, most algorithms are, quite frankly, designed to be really discriminatory in what their outputs are. Um, so saying that they have sort of a get-out-of-jail-free card just strikes me as deeply bizarre. Um, I would use the phrase deeply bizarre. And, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's nice to be able to like do something like really specific and really concrete. And like I said, like you can stall the federal government doing something really lousy for a few minutes by taking a few minutes of your time and typing it into this phrase and hitting go. And it's pretty exciting. Yes. Well, you know, one of the things that um, folks who've been um, uh, looking at uh, technology a lot, and I am not a technologist, I just sort of rely on them for, for their information. I mean, one of the things is, for example, with um, credit scores and this idea of like what, go, you know, like what is reported on dictates what the results are. I think that's one example. Um, with um, screening practices uh, for uh, rental housing, there's some stuff that's happening in there. The thing that is really creepy that people have been talking about more recently is that there are, um, through machine learning, there are algorithms that are sort of harvesting data from third-party apps in order to make determinations about your risk. A lot of those are associated with like credit, some sort of um, experimental like credit scoring and insurance under underwriting stuff. So it's where you go and who you associate with that becomes part of the determination of whether you are a risk. Well, it's basically lacking in these patterns of um, segregation and racial discrimination, right? Because, you know, where you live a lot of the time, you can make predictions about race and about income, similarly who you associate with. So then if areas that are predominantly, say, uh, Latino, are considered higher risk and you're going to higher risk areas, you're considered higher risk. Well, if you're doing that, then you, know, you are more likely to be Latino, for example. Um, so these things get baked in, in very disturbing ways. Um, go to the next one. Um, so here's just a few examples of, um, so I mentioned some of these. Um, there are certainly a ton more um, the, so the Mapping Inequality Redlining in New Deal America is this really great website that you can kind of flip through um, and it has a really great explanation of redlining and some excellent visuals and you can look at areas all over the country. Um, I mentioned Jim Crow of the North, the documentary. The Mapping Prejudice Project, um, once again, I, I think they're going to start doing some stuff in St. Paul at some point in time, but you can kind of get a picture of what those racially restrictive covenants look like. Um, Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How the Government Segregated America. If you want a lot of background on um, some of these lending practices and discrimination in that piece of the market. And then Racial Disparities, Homeownership, and Mortgage Lending in the post-Great Recession period. That is the um, Sam Myers um, paper. Lots of economics in there, uh, but really some fascinating conclusions.